and we can celebrate the hundreds in this room who go, praise God, God's on the move. There should be and there is a holy discontent in our hearts that there are now tens of thousands who are out there who don't know Jesus Christ, who don't know him, who think that Jesus is irrelevant, who think that Jesus is a swear word, who think whatever other than Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. So God is beginning like a snowball gathering momentum in our hearts as a church to say our DNA is changing. It's not just that we think about mission every so often, but that actually if we are truly loving God, we therefore become consumed with his passion, which is to convey the glory of Jesus in this world. And so that's where we're at right now. It's been an amazing year, I'm sure you'll agree. Far too many wonderful things for me to list. We've seen our biggest ever Christmas Xmas Factor extravaganza. 850 people stuffed over two nights in here, most of them don't go to church. Most of them don't know Jesus. We've seen our biggest ever carol service. We've seen a wonderful explosion of this new ministry, Healing on the Streets, that we mentioned a few moments ago. And we've seen people getting out of wheelchairs in the center of Canterbury. We've seen people with deaf ears being prayed for and them opening up. We've seen legs growing before our very eyes. It is happening. It is actually happening. Yes, you can clap and applaud the Lord because it's He who does it. We want to see so much more of God's immense power, but we are so thrilled at what he's done. It's been an amazing year. But in the last few months, as an eldership, we've been praying about the next season. Although at one level, those three M's that we're talking about still burn, and we're only just scratching the surface of it, we felt God actually whisper to us, as it were, after those big, broad brushstrokes of where we're going, it's almost like he's then given us a little, slightly more dainty little brush, and he's starting to give us some detail within that overall big picture of where God wants us to go, who he wants us to be as a church. And today, we're going to look at the four ingredients that we believe God has laid on our hearts as elders. And I want to unashamedly say that the first ingredient I'm going to spend the most time on, because the first ingredient is the most important ingredient. And if that first ingredient isn't in us, the other three won't occur. So once I've finished point one, if I spent a little time on that panic knot, It's going to be a longer point because it's the most important point and we want to really make sure that we as a church are all on the same page. So so the first aspect of the vision for the year ahead and much beyond, I'm sure it won't be finished in 12 months, but is this, is that God is calling us to become gospel drenched. Turn to the person next to you and say gospel drenched. We've chosen those words carefully. Drenched. Enjoy the word drenched. Why, why, why are we talking, why are we saying gospel drenched? When I said that to my wife, Joe, she went, oh, right. What the heck does that mean? What does it mean? 1 Corinthians 2, where your Bibles are open. These are the words of the Apostle Paul, verse 1. And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. Now look at these words, say with them. For I decided to know nothing, say nothing. Try again. Nothing. Nothing. Feel the words. God's words to us. I decide to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified, a.k.a. the gospel. It's different language. He's saying the same thing. I decided to know nothing. Is that Paul exaggerating? Nothing? Is he just saying I made it a priority amongst many things? No, he's saying I decided to know nothing else apart from Jesus, apart from what Jesus did at the cross, apart from what Jesus achieved at the cross, apart from what his resurrection now means for the entire human race, I decided to place my entire life around this one thing. Paul was gospel drenched. Turn with me to Philippians chapter 3, Philippians chapter 3, just a few pages over. He says it, similar words, in a different way. Verse 8, he says, Indeed, I count everything as loss. Now, that word loss in the Greek, that's a very polite translation. The word in Greek for loss, anyone here knows what it means? Please don't swear if you know the literal translation. It means dung. It means poo. It means excrement. (gasps) Feel, feel the extremeness if there's such a word, the the extremity, the extremeness of what Paul is trying to convey here, I can consider everything 
as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. It's a passing worth of knowing what he's done at the cross, of knowing who he is, of knowing what he has achieved, i.e. the gospel. So I hope in two verses I have very briefly convinced you that Paul was gospel drenched. He was a man who I think if he came and looked at churches and he was talking on a vision Sunday, he wouldn't be doing what many in the evangelical world across the world do, which is go, our vision is to go from 302 members to 453. That's our vision. Our vision is to see exponential growth in our giving by 9.8%. He would say, do you know Christ? Do you know him? Is the gospel which burns in your soul, is that in your DNA? Is it the thing that keeps you up at night? Is it the thing that fills your soul? Is it the thing that frees you from timidity in the natural realm? Is it the thing that means that you can join with Paul in saying, I consider everything else is lost. I don't think I even comprehend what he's saying here. I have to humbly say it. I don't think I even comprehend what Paul, what planet he's on. He is, this man, with this man, he wrote 75% of the New Testament. He saw Jesus before his very eyes. This man, his handkerchiefs made people well. This man went into the third heaven. We don't even know what that is. And yet he says, nothing else matters. All I want to know is know Christ, know the gospel. I think you kind of know him fairly well, Paul, is what I would say. But he says, no. The more I see of him, the more I have to have. The more I taste, the more I have to have more of him. The more I taste of him, the more I haven't understood him, the more glorious he becomes. He would look at us and say, City Church, all I care about. Join with me in saying, join with me in saying, I decided to know nothing except Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's all he would care about because once that is in place, everything else falls into place. When we as a people, over time, give ourselves in a hundred different ways, but to the same aim of saying, Jesus, I've got to know you. I've got to have this gospel in my soul. It's got to be so drenched upon me and in me. We become the people that we want to be. We become the people that we see throughout Scripture. We become a generous people, not because we're trying, but because of being overwhelmed by how generous God has been to us. We become a holy people, not because we're trying really hard, but because a holy God has shown us who he is and he's shown grace towards us. We become ambition-minded people, not because we're trying really hard or the elders tell us to be, but because we are overwhelmed at God who burns with mission and broke into time and space and saved the people who were evil and wicked and rebellious and had no thoughts towards him and gave us faith. And so we go, what can I do but reflect that and therefore declare with every fibre of my being, O Canterbury, know this God. Know this God that you've got so wrong. Know this God that is changing my life. He's changed it and he's going on changing it. We're becoming a people who are gospel drenched. And, and even as I say that, when, the word, when we look at the word gospel, if we're honest, it's a kind of strange word. It's a word we don't often use in any other part of Life in language. Do you know what the translation of the word gospel is? I'm sure you do. It means, I mean, maybe it's just me. It doesn't, in my mind, quite sum up linguistically the brilliance of what we're talking about. Maybe it's just me. It's like, I'm going to build my life around good news. You know, it's a little bit polite. You know, it's kind of like saying, I don't know, you get a letter through the post and your some long list, you know, distant aunt has died, and you've got 20 million quid. And it's like the equivalent of walking into your sink to your wife having breakfast and saying, hello, my darling, I have some satisfa satisfactory data to convey to you today. You know, no, no, you'd burst in and be like, you're never going to believe what's happened. And so when even we use the word gospel and this translation of good news, it, it of course does convey that it's, yeah, it's good news, but it's a thousand times greater than just good news. It's the most stupendous news that we could ever comprehend. And we have to be a people that understand, and we often think this, or certainly I do, is that when we think of the gospel, we think of it's the first step that we take to becoming a Christian. 
in a stairway of truth. We go from the gospel into greater things. Tim Keller, an amazing theologian and pastor from New York, says this, the gospel is not the first step in a stairway of truths. Rather, it is the hub. Say, the hub. The hub hub in a wheel of truth. The gospel is not just the ABCs, but it's the A to Zs of Christianity. The gospel is not the minimum required doctrine necessary to enter the kingdom, but listen to this, but the way we make all progress in the kingdom. Martin Luther famously said, the gospel is the principal article of all Christian doctrine. Most necessary is it that we know this article well, that we teach it to others, and I love this, and that we beat it into our heads continually. Okay, Martin Luther says we need to be those who are, metaphorically, beating the gospel into our heads. That it's the thing that changes us. It's the thing, and and when I say the word drenched, I mean the word drenched, okay? We're not talking about gospel dipped, okay? You know, a lot of us here are British, and we're like, gospel dipped, I'm happy to be dipped. I don't want to be drenched, Tom, thank you very much, that sounds a little bit extravagant. You know, when we think of dipped, we think of perhaps paddling it, you know, Whitstable Beach, and oh my goodness, I dipped my, the hem of my jean into the water. No, no, change the image, we're thinking of a big crazy dog, Dulex, you know, dog, launching itself into the water, diving in, drenched completely, and coming out and going, and everyone getting completely soaked around it. Because as we get drenched in the gospel in the coming days, weeks, and months, and years, do you know what? As we, the more that we are drenched, the more that we will just splash this city with the news of Jesus. We won't even be trying. Just be coming out of us. We won't be focusing on it. We're focusing on Christ and the gospel. Saying, Lord, lead me by the hand into this great truth that I know I've only scratched. If the Apostle Paul says it, how much more do I need to say, God, teach me this thing. Open the eyes of my heart. Give me revelation to see this thing. Let it be the raw power of God in my life. It needs to become something that our, our theology, our ecclesiology, which is our, our words about how we structure church, everything, every ology is around the gospel. It needs to be that everything is centered around it. I said last week, Ecclesiastes tells us that God has set eternity in the hearts of men and women. What he's saying there is this, is that every man, woman, or child who's ever been born or who will be born, at the core of their being, there is a gap of eternity, to quote Matt Chandler. The gap of eternity that we try as humans to fill with, you know, with sex or fame or our career or money or you name it. And for a period of time, it might dull the ache, but it's always coming back. It's always coming back. Every time you get that thing that you thought would give you the ultimate satisfaction, you go, do you know what? That ache, that longing, it's back. And I want to say here today, as I said last week, that's because an eternal gap, eternity in our hearts, can only be filled by one thing, an eternal God, the eternal gospel. And that's why we, more than ever as a church, are this year, we are giving ourselves, pursuing passionately, being a people who become gospel-drenched. I don't know about you, I I yearn, I yearn, I yearn to see more of the Holy Spirit's power in my life and in your lives and in this city. I, anyone here join me with that? Yeah. I yearn for it. If you've read anything of this book, if you're familiar with any of church history, if you've talked to anyone in the world who's actually in a country which is ablaze with revival power, it just ruins you for when you look at what we're not tasting yet. I yearn to see the Holy Spirit's magnificent, scary, awesome, sin-exposing power in this city and in my life. I yearn for it. I yearn for it. I yearn for it. And I want to say this, is that there is the most indestructible connection in Scripture between the gospel of Jesus Christ and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. You just see it everywhere is that when Jesus is made famous, when Jesus is faithfully proclaimed, what do you always see? It's like the Holy Spirit, he just has to get poured out. He just gets so excited, he has to just come and make the news that is being proclaimed ablaze in people's hearts. 
as we proclaim Jesus, as we become drenched in knowing the gospel, what happens is the Holy Spirit is poured out in glorious power. In Acts chapter 10, we haven't got time to go there. It's a classic. Peter is communicating news about Jesus to a guy called Cornelius, who was a Gentile, non-Jew. He's talking to him, he's saying, so Jesus Christ, he's the way, the truth, and life. He's explaining about Jesus, he's giving the gospel, and then it just says these words, <laughs> and then the Holy Spirit fell on them. It, he just fell on them. And it's like Peter's mid-flow. He's like, he's only got to point one out of his 25-point sermon. How rude. The Holy Spirit just goes, bosh, on these people, unsuspecting. They hear about Jesus. And suddenly there is an invisible and yet utterly real power in, the, in their inner beings. The Holy Spirit falls on them. I love 1 Thessalonians 1.5. Paul says, our gospel came to you not only in word, it came to you in word, but not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. When your gospel drenched, you proclaim Jesus, you lift him high and you say to all who will listen, look at Jesus. He is what you are looking for in your life. What happens is the Holy Spirit comes with full power and with full conviction. I love it. Romans 1.16 famously says, for the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. It's not just that it brings it, although it does. It actually is the power of God unto salvation. Get your heads around that. Everyone's looking, but oh, absolutely. It's a mind bender. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Tim Keller goes on to say these amazing words. He says this. It's very common in church to think as follows. The gospel is for non-Christians. One needs it to be saved. But once saved, you grow through hard work and obedience. But Colossians 1.6 shows this is a mistake. This is what, what Colossians 1, 6 is. It says, all over the world, this gospel is bearing fruit and growing. The gospel is like a seed and it grows. And just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it, listen to this, and understood God's grace in all its truth. The gospel bears fruit as we understand it and as it grows and as we see it in all its truth. So what does this practically mean? You can feel my heart, I hope, at least a little bit here. What does it practically mean, Tom? Well, we're doing a few things that will, I hope, facilitate this. First of all, our preaching series that's starting in two weeks' time, based around this amazing book called Death by Love. Read it with a seatbelt attached because it's fairly in your face. But it presents the gospel in amazing ways. It shows 12 different, as it were, sides of the diamond that are the gospel and how it is the most relevant thing to the hurting world out there. You can think right now of your friend who's the most needy person that had the most difficult life and this book will show you how the gospel needs to be in their life. It shows you what angle of the gospel we need to understand to actually unlock people's hurts and needs and to show them that when Jesus died and rose again, it was the most relevant thing in their life. We're going to be preaching through the book as it were, looking at the truths that Mark Driscoll unpacks in the next two terms. Encourage you, if you've never brought a non-Christian friend to church, please pray, seek God, invite as many non-Christian friends as you can in the next two terms because every Sunday we are believing that there will be salvation. We believe it every week, every week, but particularly in that time. I want to say secondly, how to become gospel drenched. We're going to be breaking bread starting in two weeks' time when we start this series virtually every week. As a church, we have neglected doing this. We've done it sometimes. And we, you know, there's no great sort of discussion we need to have. We just need to do it. It's very clearly an intrinsic part of the New Testament life. It seems that they almost did it daily. And so, praise God, every week, without exception almost, we hope, we are going to be, at the end of the service, before we finish, we're going to be breaking bread together because it keeps us centred around Christ. As we feast on the bread, as we drink the wine or the juice, we actually, we, it's a way that God has given us to stay centred and drenched in the gospel. We're going to be praying our hearts out on Tuesday, Thursday nights, as we've heard. And we're going to be saying, God, drench us in your gospel. Drench us in the person of Jesus. Drench us in the presence of God. Because we're never going to see a single person changed unless we're drenched in your wonderful presence. And we're going to be praying our hearts out and believing that in vision that is growing all the time. 
we are believing that in the coming year we will see magnificent growth and that actually it will form the nucleus of a multiple service in 12 months' time or so. It's an amazing opportunity because meeting at 6 in the evening is a wonderful time when many perhaps wouldn't make it at this time on a Sunday morning, but they might just about make it in the evening. And so we are praying, Lord, let this be another way that the gospel is proclaimed in the city, the lost are saved and added. Very specifically, one other thing that we mentioned last night at the members, e uh, members' evening meeting is that we are pressing pause on Alpha for the next 12 months. I say pressing pause because we may well take our finger off pause again. We've done Alpha for many years and we've seen great, amazing fruit from it. The thing about Alpha, though, is that if you're going to do it, you kind of need to really do it. It needs to be the big thing you do. And as a church, we do a lot of things. And so we want to just be sure that actually it's the right tool for us. You know, you can, you can probably uh, tighten a, a bolt with a hammer, but actually it's probably better to put the tool down and use a, a spanner. And we just want to make sure that we're using the right tool. It may well be in the coming months that there's a, a righteous growing frustration and you guys say, Tom, we need Alpha back, which is God's way of speaking to us, actually, and which we will then place it back at the centre. But the other main model that you see in terms of expressing the gospel in churches across the world, other than focusing mainly on Alpha, is actually making Sunday morning the place where the gospel is proclaimed. Where although Christians get fed every single week, like in Alpha, non-Christians can come in, can hear what we're looking at, and can inquire. And actually, the goal, therefore, is that every single person in the church is equipped with the gospel so that you can then dialogue with your non-Christian friends as they come and actually help them on their journey to know Jesus. They're two different models, and actually both are biblical. They're both biblical. But we want to seek God in the coming year for, Lord, what's the right one for us? Is it a combination, or is it one or the other? So pray for us in the coming years, elders, as we seek God for that. So first of all then, we're called to be gospel, gospel drenched. But secondly, out of the overflow of that, therefore, we're called secondly to see widespread discipleship. Widespread discipleship. Now, turn your Bibles to Matthew 28. Matthew chapter 28 and verse 19. Very famous bit of scripture. Jesus said these words. He said, go therefore and make disciples, not converts, disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them. Okay, that's fine. No problem with that bit. Teaching. That's okay. We can do our best at that. I'm sure there's lots more we can improve on, but you know, teaching, teaching them is fine. The next few words haunt me. Teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Do you see that there? Teaching them so that they observe all that I have commanded you. He's defining discipleship. He's defining what it is to be a disciple. Observing in your life, in the secret place, in the place where no one is there with you, that you and us and we together become a people who do everything, say everything, everything, everything that Jesus wants us to be. Those are massive words that Jesus said. These are massive words, and our longing is that as we get point one in the core of our beings, as we become gospel-drenched, and we inevitably see more and more men, women, and children come in here and go, do you know what? I've heard the news. I want to give my life to Christ. Is that then we as a church are ready, willing, able, trained as best as we can be to disciple and invest in people. Now, if you're part of this church, in a general sense, if you come to prayer meetings, Sunday mornings, cell groups, there's an ongoing general kind of iron sharpening iron discipleship kind of deal anyway. But what we're talking about here is what you see in the New Testament of a specific, intentional, more intensive type of iron sharpening iron. You see Jesus with his three and with his 12 and with his 70. You see Paul with his Timothy. This intimate relationship is the way that we become followers of Christ. Now, in student work for many years, we've, it's glorious what God's done in the students here in the last, well, really since the church began 20 years ago. Um, and student work has always been in an area where we've been overt about you need to either, you need to disciple people and you need to be discipled. 
So if you're a student here, I'm sure someone said that to you. Who disciples you? Are you discipling anyone? It's just an assumed thing. It's, it's something that we're all living with. But the glorious problem we have in the last 12 months is that people are coming here who aren't students, praise God, in their 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and they're saying, I want to follow this Jesus. And I, I, I've made that decision, I've made that step, but now I need to be invested in I now need what you're talking about. And of course that's happening to some degree, but what we're sensing in God's heart for us, a plan is that we need to be those who are more intentional than ever before. So that we don't just see discipleship in one little area, but it becomes widespread across the church. It becomes something that serves the entire body. And there's a couple of main ways that you can do discipleship. There's a couple of main sort of strategies on the market, as it were. There's first of all what we call the organic model, which is basically put two people together, give them a Bible, and leave them to get on with it. You know? And, you know, kind of pull Timothy. Uh, they're together. You know, they're going to pray together. They're going to be accountable. There's high levels of honesty that can be in there. There's the kind of organic model, as it were. But then there's also, secondly, the more like linear or programmatic way of doing it, which is kind of like Paul. You see in the Hall of Tyrannus in Ephesus, where he says he taught for three years. And he's, it's where we, someone speaks to a group of people and is able to convey a body of information and it's very efficient. It's not so much based around the person, but more around the material. It's very efficient. You can measure it because people have done steps one and two and I was there in week four and I'm making progress. And both are, again, biblical. But in the coming year and beyond, we're saying, Lord, Lord, what is the city, sh- city church-shaped way that you want this to be seen here? What is the, the specific thing? I just want to say uh, a date for your diaries on the 17th of October on Saturday. Sarah Davis, who burns with discipleship, I don't know if you're here, Sarah. Sarah's going to be running a kind of workshop for those who are wanting to, to get confident in discipling. Saturday, the 17th of October, come up for the morning and we will hopefully give you some tools as to, you know, how to be a good discipler and, uh, and all that kind of stuff. But we want to say this, is this, is that I dream, I dream of older men and women, and that might be in age or it might be in spiritual maturity. Older men and women who say, Tom, guys, give me four men that I can pour my life into. Four men that I can pour, like a laser beam, like a magnifying glass with the sun's rays, I can magnify and I can pour my life into them. I dream of that. And I know, so, so many of you are saying, Tom, I've got a lot of things in my life, that I'm, but, but if I can serve in that way, I want to do it. You know, I, many years ago, I've been a Christian 11 years now, and I remember very early on in my faith, probably two, year, two years in, I was a third year, I was a hippie, and I was a very, very young Christian. And Pete Gregory, over there, many of you know Pete, is an absolute legend. Pete, headmaster of a school, you know, wears a suit. Dozens of people report to him. He said, Tom, if you want, I'll disciple you. Really? You, you'll spend time with me? Wow. And I remember so clearly, I remember it like it was yesterday, in my smelly, grotty, studenty room. You know, I'd sort of try and clear up a bit before Pete came, but it was just, you know, there's that boy smell, isn't there? Student, it's just like, oh, open the window, quick. And Pete would come after an exhausting day, and he would sit there, and as only Pete can, he'd just listen. Would just that wonderful faith and his kind, kind eyes and wisdom and just let me talk about a load of rubbish, you know, which girl I was hung up on again and, and he just listen and love. And over those times we met, I look back now and go, what a privilege, what a privilege that he would come and he would wash my feet. That's what he was doing. He was coming and he was washing my feet middle-aged man coming after a busy day and saying, I want to I wanna serve you. Do you know, it's, the, it's here. It, the ingredients are here. It just needs to be joined up. The dots just need to be joined up. Because even as I'm saying that, there are so many of you saying, Tom, I want to do that. I want to serve in that way. And there's so many of you here going, I need that. I need that right now. <laughs> so we're just saying, we want to join the dots. We want to join the dots. We want to see widespread. Say widespread. widespread. Say it again. Widespread. Come on. Widespread discipleship. I'm so excited. Thirdly, we must move on. Thirdly, we're longing to see 
the acceleration of leadership development. Now, this kind of speaks for itself. We long to see the acceleration of leadership development. Three long words. We believe in the gift of leadership. If we're going to become gospel drenched and therefore our characters are going to become more and more like Christ, within that context, we're going to see men and women who go, do you know what? I think God might, I think he might be calling me to lead something. Romans 12 talks about the gift of leadership. And this is the thing, this is the deal, isn't it? Is that in, in the biblical world, it's the unlikely people who God calls. Isn't it true? Again and again, you can give so many scriptural examples where people who are like running for cover and God says, it's you. And he picks them up and like, no, no, you know, Moses, desperate. No, not me, Lord. That's certainly my story. I couldn't even leave myself let alone a blimmin' church. And you think, oh, Tom, you're just being humble. No, no, I'm really, I'm really saying it. I'm really, really, it's really true. You know, I didn't lead anything before becoming a Christian and just saying, all I said to God was, God, I'm available. And I'll just try and be faithful with this, the things you give me, which at first was small, and then there was a bit more, and then, oh, a little bit more, and then, blimey, there's all these people here. It's a whole church of people. It's God's grace. It's totally God's grace. That's always the way it's going to be. So he gets the glory. And no one if, who knows me is ever going to doubt that. They're like, oh yeah, we know it's God on you. I love you, but we can see it's God on you, not you. So what I'm saying is this. What am I saying? I'm saying this, listen. When we talk about acceleration of leadership development, that sounds something like Barack Obama would say, isn't it, or something? Which using, I'm just saying here, leadership in the Bible is about people who discount themselves. I'm not talking about you being grossly in sin or something. I'm just saying that you're broken by the gospel, that you're aware of your faults, but that you love Jesus and you love people and you will be faithful with what he gives you. And if you can say, yeah, and I know dozens and dozens of you, that's, that's the truth for you here. We're going to therefore going to seek God for the right ways, systems and people to encourage you and to see your leadership development so that you can influence for Jesus, become more and more and more and more in line with what God would have for you. It's going to take time. John Maxwell says, leaders develop daily, not in a day. We're looking for leaders that you can trust. Because this is the re- leadership is about trust. If you can't trust someone, you're never going to follow their vision. We're looking about leaders who understand that the best leaders are those who first are the best followers. We're going for leaders who can lead other leaders so that God can multiply exponentially all he's doing. We're looking for leaders who right from the beginning of their sphere of influence realize they've got to be thinking about their legacy. What happens when I'm not leading here? Even from the word go, I'm thinking about who can I raise up? Who can I invest with the right DNA for this ministry project or so or whatever it is that God's given me so that when I'm gone. I love the story of Roberto Guazzetto who started Coca-Cola, one of the biggest companies in the world. And it's said that when he died, I love this, Coca-Cola didn't even hiccup. Did you get it? Didn't even hiccup the company. It just pumped on because he was a man who was a leader who lived with with leaving a legacy. So that when he died, actually, it didn't matter because ultimately the people, the systems, the ways were in place. So that company could continue going forward. So what does that mean? We're going for quality and quantity. We need more leaders, but we also need more and more godly leaders men and women who are broken for the things of Christ. Practically, we are introducing a a new wider leaders meeting once a term. Many of you would have already received um, an email about it. For for many years now, we've had uh, meetings and invested in our cell leaders. But we've realized actually for those in other projects and ministries, there hasn't been that same kind of ongoing investment. And so for those of you who lead projects and ministries, now once a term, we're encouraging you to come on that Wednesday evening as an eldership. We're going to be giving time to invest in you and hopefully encourage you and sharpen your gifting so that you can become all that God wants you to become. And I just want to say this, is that there's many of you here who may be not in the church world, but maybe in your kingdom environment, you are a mighty leader. You have been raised up by God to have great influence. And I want to say this, and I really mean, we really mean this, please talk to us as elders. Come and make yourselves known. Come and help us in this wonderful adventure of seeing leadership all across this church accelerated because many of the principles that you will have been uh, inherited and been given will actually help us to help you guys to develop and so that as leaders grow, 
they are growing in the pace that God wants them to, that we're not slowing everything up because, oh, we haven't got enough leaders for anything. No, no, we're intentionally raising people up. Christ said it is better to serve than to be served. And biblical leadership is all about serving. So, we're looking to be gospel-drenched. We're looking to see widespread discipleship. We're looking to accelerate leadership development. And finally, we are looking to resource the region and beyond. Throughout the scripture, you, you can't get away from it, is that in the New Testament you see God again and again put special anointing, special favor upon certain churches so that they would burn brighter and fiercer and so that their sparks would affect all the regions around them. You see Jerusalem, the Jerusalem church. You see in Antioch, you see the church in Ephesus. And, and there's many more examples. And we are part of a movement, New Frontiers, that is all across the world now. I think there's 800 plus churches within New Frontiers. In the UK, we are church planting one new church every single month. So now, currently, there's almost 220 churches in the UK. So we're part of something far bigger than just Canterbury, as glorious as this is. We are part of a global movement that God, in his sovereign kindness, has graced us to be part of. Now, we are continuously trying to lift our gazes as a church so that we are all the time giving ourselves here, but also to the region and beyond. There has been a stream of wonderful prophecies from, from, from men who have got reputable uh, histories and that we know and love with integrity who have spoken so many words along these lines. For example, 2006, Keith Hazel uh, prophesied over, over us as a church. He said, you would have national impact you'd be ascending and resourcing base. 2006, Julian Adams says, there's an international anointing on the church. Many people coming and going and being trained and being sent. 2007, an American um, pro prophet guy called Ben Goodman said, the church is a massive resource church, like a Walmart. God is giving us more resources than we can possibly hold on to, and the way we get all he has for us is to give away our very best people, resources, and money. Can I have a hallelujah? Well done. Almost convinced me. This is something not to be resisted. Phil Wolfie, 2007, say, said, I see a big church in years to come, thousands of people, mighty ability to raise up leaders, and you'll be asked by other people to go and help them do likewise. This is a big one. 2008, Ginny, who's a woman from Sheffield. If you know Ginny, she is like, in the natural realm, she wouldn't say boot to a goose, but every so often God speaks to her in amazing ways. Amazing ways that have shaped the whole movement. She prophesied quite famously about Princess Diana dying before it happened, a long time before it happened. And uh, I was at a, a prayer and fasting event a year ago, just like, and Lord, I want to lift you. You know, just pray, praising away. And suddenly there was a hand on my shoulder. It was Ginny. Ah, ah, ah. <laughs> I was actually quite terrified. And she said, Tom, I just feel God wants to speak to you. And I was like, okay, fine. Roger was there. And she basically prophesied. She said these words. She said, I saw movement all over you, Tom. Staying still physically, but movement all around me. Bringing movement all around me. People coming and moving through me to church, plant, and to move all across to different places. This was of God and not to be resisted. And that I and the church were going to help people to cross their Jordans. Their Jordans, their rivers. That we as a church, God has said in so many different ways, He seems so kind. So that we don't get upset when God calls men and women to actually go and pioneer in this area and beyond. That we go, yes, yes and amen. My goodness, this, this nation is desperate for men and women who will say, Lord, like Isaiah, send me. Send me. Send me. And so we will continue to send people that we dearly love. And we will, we will send them with a whole heart. We will be looking to, to raise up those amongst the church who say, Tom, one day I feel God might want me to be part of something. We will do our very best to invest in you guys who fit into that category and help you so that one day when God does call you to go and do something, you might be called to lead a church plant. You might be called just to be a fantastic, faithful follower in a church plant. Either way, for those of you amongst the ranks, we want to intentionally resource this region and beyond. There's going to be those people coming who are not part of the ranks, who are going to hear about what God's doing here, and they're going to get plugged in. Kevin Lydia Jones, many of you will know and love dearly, have just recently come back to the church. Woohoo! We love you guys. And they're here for a season, but they've been, they've been clear. God's burdened our hearts with the nations. 
We love Canterbury, but God's ruined us, and he's continuing to do that. We want to play our part one day in somewhere other than here. And at the moment, I hope it's okay to say, God seems to be speaking to me about Finland. Praise God. Praise God. <laughs> Finland? <laughs> it's fantastic. That's got to be God, isn't it? <laughs> Helsinki. Nupois. It's just brilliant. <laughs> Bring it on. And we will, when people are here for that season, we will love them. We won't tut tut and go, lightweight, only here for two years. No, no, we'll go, praise God. You are so welcome. Come, drink, make merry, be with us. And then we will send you with everything we can. Because Paul said, as you, as you, if you so generously, you will, as we give, as we give, as we give, as we give, as we give. I'm thrilled to announce today the uh, imminent arrival of uh, Matt Hogg. Now, many of you will know Liam Thatcher and Helen, who um, were, Matt, they were both employed by New Frontiers. Liam, particularly, was uh, employed doing student work nationally, based in our offices, and God sent them off to London a few months ago. And uh, in the last few weeks, God has clearly highlighted a guy called Matt Hogg, who's an outstanding guy who's been very involved with student work. He's an elder, he was an elder in a church on the South Coast. And uh, he is now going to be replacing Liam, being paid for by New Frontiers, based in Canterbury with his lovely wife and they are selling their house down in Portsmouth. It's on the market right now and they're putting an offer at a house in Story. Lord Jesus, give it to them. They, they, they sent something of God on this church and they, they've looked far and wide and they said, we want to be there. We want to be there. Why? Because one day, actually, we know God wants us to be part of a pioneering situation somewhere in this world. We don't know where. And we will say, come, you are so welcome. You can be here for a year, or two years or longer. We're going to love you the length of time that God gives you here. We're called to be a people that embrace. And we also believe that being a church that wants to resource the region and beyond, it also means this, is that God will give us, we believe, men and women of seniority, of real weight and maturity, who will be here for the long haul. Now, we're not announcing anything specifically today, but we just believe in our hearts, that's all we can say, is that as we give, is that God's going to give us mighty men and women who are going to say, we're going to be here. We're going to help father this church. We're going to help mother this church. We're going to be here for the long haul to so that God can flourish. We're going to be stakes in the ground in this city. We're going to stand with you shoulder to shoulder for the long haul so that as God grows this church, as God sees so many come in and get gospel drenched and get discipled, get raised up into leadership and then go boom, like firing arrows off all across this world. Does that excite anyone here? Ah, yeah. oh, that's good. It excites me, I tell you what. It's what I'm living for. It's what I'm living for. If you were to ask me, Tom, what's the vision of the church? We can honestly say it's here to change the world. I believe that when Jesus said, go out to all the nations and make disciples, he's saying change the world. Don't you dare look at your own weaknesses and your own frailties and go, oh, I'm just going to try and get through this life and then meet Jesus in heaven. God's lifting our gaze. He's lifting our gaze. Scripture compels us to lift our gaze and to say to live is Christ, to die is gain. My whole life is going to be ever more consumed with the gospel and the glory of Jesus Christ. I want to give myself to investing in men and women. I want to be humble and let men and women invest in me. I want to be someone, if God raises up into a leader, I want to do a thousand and ten percent. And I want to be open to God saying, go, fly. That's what God's calling us to. It's a global adventure rooted here in this location. We're called to, to, to change a city, to change a county, to change a country, to change a continent. We are here genuinely to play our part in ushering in the return of the king. That's why we're here. That's why we're here. And what we want to say, you are so welcome here. We want to say, if you want to be part of us as a church, come with us and we will do you good, to quote a famous man. Come with us and serve your heart out. Learn that it's better to serve than to be served. Come here and join us in this adventure of saying, Lord, show us this truth. Let us join with Paul in saying, everything else is loss compared with the surpassing greatness of Jesus. If that's really true, if that's really true, if we focus on that, everything else is detail.